Welcome. My name is Sharon Query. I'm the Education Coordinator at Holden Village, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the third in the series in our Interfaith webinar series um, sponsored by Holden Village and Paths to Understanding. Um, I would my pleasure to introduce Reiner Waldman Adkins. We would had hoped and planned that Reiner and his wife Deb would be in the village this week in at Holden, but we know um, that of course isn't possible. Reiner Waldman Atkins is a Hebrew calligrapher, painter, muralist, and printmaker with a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Washington. He is the program art specialist with launch at Kimball Elementary School in Seattle and is a freelance multi-generational educator in art, art history, and Jewish culture. And he is speaking tonight on humanity created in the image of holiness. Thank you, Reiner. Thank you. My name is Terry Kylo. I'm the executive director of Paths to Understanding. I've been a Lutheran pastor for 29 years, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be with all of you tonight. I'm sad not to be with you at Holden Village, and we're happy to have Reiner join us. Uh, we want to let you all know how you can participate tonight and, uh, and sort of uh, make this a real interactive uh, event. There's a chat feature at the bottom of your, of your, um, your window, your kind of your Zoom window. And you can kind of roll your mouse over mouse over that, or you can kind of move your finger over that. And if you want, if you're on an iPad or something like that. So if you want to ask Reiner a question or ask him to slow down or say something again, just put that in the chat or in the Q&A, and I'll be sure and, and let him know. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we will also be uh, monitoring those, uh, the, those comments, and I will relay those as well. So with that, Reiner, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm going to give some disclaimers first. Um, first of all, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm nervous. It's something that's a webinar and as compared to the usual very interactive work that I do. And I wish I could be with all of you being interactive and actually being able to make art together. <clears throat> so this is going to be more of a somewhat more of a lecture and I apologize for that. I'm probably covering too much. We'll see how that works. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not an expert. I'm a knowledgeable lay person and um, but but I'm approaching the tradition from that perspective of that it's accessible to anyone. I am able to interpret and to share. A decent amount of what I'm going to be talking to you about really is what I'll call both Jewish process and artistic process. Um, I'm coming very, very much from a Jewish perspective, but the ideas we're talking about can be applied to a lot of other traditions. The, the general attitude can be applied to other traditions. And it'd be good to have a pencil and paper on hand because it might be useful for you to take some notes. And a lot of what we're going to be doing tonight is really um, utilizing the rabbinic tradition as a form of time travel social media process of commentary and debate over the centuries. So with that, we can, we can get going with my PowerPoint presentation. So our theme is humanity created in the image of holiness. I'm working to reflect the general theme of this week that was going to be at Holden Village. And indeed, I am most regretful that I can't be there with everybody I met last year and new friends. So what's visual midrash? Because we're going, the whole idea of midrash is really, really key to what I'm talking about today. Midrash is the Jewish tradition of storytelling that, that expands the written scripture. Rabbinic teachings tell us that two Torahs were given to people at Mount Sinai, a written Torah and a spoken Torah, the oral Torah. In other words, all the commentaries sense that symbolic, um, in, incredibly intense exp story experience at Mount Sinai is also part of the Bible, according to the tradition. Midrash tells the stories that aren't written down. It's 
really reading between the lines and filling in the gaps. It's a method for dealing with complexity and challenge, and it's a living tradition. And midrash can be spoken, written, or made with art. In other words, visual midrash. Examples of midrash include the story that when God witnessed the Egyptian army drowning in the Sea of Reeds, the angels were going to break into song and celebrate, and God rebuked them. How dare you sing for joy when my creatures are dying, when my, the children I created are dying. So clearly, somebody in the tradition was not comfortable with that story. They had to work with it. They had to wrestle with it. Here's a delightful midrash that when Moses literally wrote the Torah, his face became radiant. How? Because the Torah that, that Moses was writing was written with white fire and black fire and sealed with fire and entwined with fire. And when he was writing, he wiped his pen on his hair and that's how his face became radiant. As a calligrapher, I love that particular midrash. So those are examples of the midrashic tradition, which is incredibly important to the whole process of analysis and commentary and interpretation we're doing tonight. So the texts we're going to look at tonight are from Genesis. And they're the two stories of the creation of the human and the story of the creation of, of Eve. And we're going to be looking at these stories because they really amplify the theme that was chosen for this week, us, them, and all. Weaving our identities, and I can't see my screen because of how it's set up, but really weaving our identities into the common humanity. And we will explore that theme, us, them, and all, by looking at four takeaways from the Genesis creation stories. And you can see the four focuses. How do we find universal humanity in them? The modeling of a balance between judgment and mercy. The gender spectrum and how fluid that can be. And gender equality and partnership. So hopefully some of you have the packet that got sent out that shows the text we're going to be working with. But here it is. So here's the first creation story. And I've boxed the, I've boxed the text that I really want to zero in on. That God said, let us make humanity in our image after our likeness. We're created in the image of God, but Selim Elohim and we're created male and female. And it looks straightforward here, except it's not. And we're going to dig much more into that. And then there's the second creation story, that when, that when heaven and earth are created, that, that and there's, there is earth and there is water, that God forms humanity from the dust of the earth and blows the breath of life into, into the human. And you notice I'm being a little iffy about how I'm describing that, that creature that Adam has created. Uh, later on, we're going to talk about the creation story of Eve. And we're going to especially zero in on God casting a deep sleep upon the human. And while the human sleeps, taking a body part, again, I'm going to be ambiguous there, although you see ribs from the, from the, the human's flesh, and that takes that body part and fashions it into a new creature who will be named Eve, Chava in Hebrew. So those are the texts that we're really going to explore as we move into the capability to do visual midrash. So 
our first focus is the idea of the universalism of humanity and the idea that we are created in the image of the divine. As it says in the text that you see below from the Bible. This idea of, being, of all of us being created with a spark of holiness in us is in the Jewish tradition, one of the most critical aspects of work for human rights. And I'll just start with that idea. It's so important that the premier, the leading human rights organization in Israel is named B'Tselem. After that quote from the Torah, from the Bible, that humans are created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of, of God, in the image of holiness. And I urge you to look up B'Tselem they're an incredibly important organization doing work to end the occupation and to work for civil rights and human rights in Israel and also in the Palestinian territories, in the occupied territories. So that, so I commented that I was being ambiguous about what I was calling that creature that, that God created. So let's take a look at the, at the name Adam, Adam. It comes from the Hebrew Adama, which means earth or dirt. And because Hebrew words always work with roots, it's related to the word Adom, red, and Dom, blood, and other words as well. And in Hebrew, Adam is, Adam is both a name and the word for human. And, and it can, in, in the context that we're working with, it can literally mean earth creature. That's why I have a pile of dirt there. And also an incredibly ancient clay figurine from, from more than 8,000 years ago from Anatolia. So the rabbis asked, why was only one human created? And the answer is because every person must say, for my sake, the world was created. And the Mishnah, the commentary was four reasons why God at first created only one human being. And they're very, very relevant to the issue of universal human humanity and universal human rights. The first reason was meant to teach us that if one human being is destroyed, it's as if you're destroying a whole world. And if you save one person, it's as if you save an entire world. So in this current circumstance where we're saying that black, brown, and indigenous lives matter in the United States of America, just imagine the work that's being done and how many worlds are being saved. The second reason is that nobody can brag about their lineage, what in Yiddish we call yichas, their pedigree. Because we all came from one person made from earth, no one can say my parent is greater than yours. And for that matter, no one can say that the dirt I was made from is better than the dirt you were made from. The third reason that the rabbi said in a religious context is to prove that there's only one God. If every if there was the belief that if there was a belief from the rabbinic perspective that that was different, people could claim that. Multiple gods created their, home, their own human being, and, their, and therefore that division would be sown, that the unity of humanity would be negated. And the fourth reason is simply to show the wonder of creation. Even though one human was created, and each, each subsequent person theoretically has, that, has Adam's genes, no two people are alike. And so we have incredible complexity in the world, and that's, from the rabbinic point of view, a miracle and it, teach, it reinforces the idea that each person must say, for their sake, the world was created. So continuing the theme of being dirt, that Adam was created from Adama, that Adam, Adam is an earth creature. I want to go off on a tangent for a moment because the themes we're working with 
in terms of universalism are so indeed universal. In the Mayan creation story, two creator gods, a god and a goddess, when the world is dark, speak about what they're going to use to create the world and what they're going to use to create humans. And other creatures advise them, of course, you're going to create humans from cornmeal. And then the Mayan creation story actually goes on to, in remarkable ways, reflect the Genesis story from the Bible. And then here's a story. Oop, I just um, made a mistake. Sorry, folks. Okay. Um, I pushed the wrong button. Don't Sorry worry about, about it. That. Okay. Okay. Does that look okay, Terry? Okay, your sound's off. It looks good. Okay. So so there's a Californian indigenous creation story that in the beginning there was no light, no, no land, only darkness and the vast waters of the outer ocean. And that the earth maker and great grandfather are afloat in their canoe. And the earth maker took soft clay and formed the figure of a man and of a woman. And this is so remarkably echoing of our own, of the creation story in the Abrahamic traditions. And here is, here is a quote from the Quran, which mentions that taking the, creating the human from clay. And again, in the Abrahamic traditions, we see that echo. So what is the Bible stories about humans being made from earth teach about universal dignity and rights? In both the Jewish and the Muslim traditions, an angel, Michael or Gabriel, is sent forth to gather many colors of earth from the four corners of the world for mixing and shaping into the, into the primordial human. And that's where we get the idea that no one can say, no human can say that the earth I'm made from is better than the earth you're made from. And, and then there's, a, the, both of these are from what's called Targum Yonatan, which is a very ancient uh, uh, commentary on the Bible. And I love this particular idea that that uh, dust was taken from the place of the house of the sanctuary and from the four winds of the world and mixed with all the waters of the world and creating the human red, black, and white and breathing into the nostrils the inspiration of life. And this is a work of art that I did, um, a banner I did, which shows the angel Gabriel with a tray containing jars with the fork with many colors of earth and the potential for humanity within those colors. Now we're going to look at some art about the creation of Adam, just to get your thoughts moving along. And I'm wondering if anybody has any questions before we do that.
I'm not seeing any questions yet, Reiner. Okay. So this is probably one of the most famous creation images that you can imagine. If you look for art on the creation of Adam, it's almost impossible to be get beyond Michelangelo on the internet. And this is what people think of the most, I'd say, if they think of the creation of Adam. Suffice it to say that there's other ways to look at this. Oh, and one of the things here that we need to acknowledge is also the different traditions about how we view God as a creative force. So in, a, in the Jewish and Muslim traditions, uh, an image of God like this is not something that we would do. Here is, is a spoof on that particular image that I could not resist. Um, Freddie Fa uh, Fabris uh, did a series of photographs insp inspired by classic paintings. Yep. Here, is, here is a painting by Harmonia Rosales, The Creation of God. Where, where God and, and the human and all the figures are people of color. They're black. And this actually caused quite a firestorm on the, in, in the virtual world when she painted this painting for multiple reasons. Here are some images two quite old and one more modern that show that show the creation. Um, in one case, it's really almost like an angel um, being the emissary of God. It's, uh, it's from a detail from a Russian icon. We see the Grebel masterpiece from Germany where, where Again, there's a figure creating the human who is emerging from the earth. And then, and then we have this uh, creation of Adam wood carving by Tadeusz Kowalski, where being created in the image of God seems to be very literal. And then this is a detail of a mural that I did at Congregation Beth Shalom in Seattle. This is the section that's about this, the sixth day of creation when the human is cr created. The final uh, description of the human being created. And one th thing I'm going to point out here is that A, I'm showing a diversity of hands of different colors being engaged in self-creation. Second, the image of, of the human form is, is not specifically gendered. And number three, the, there's a Hebrew letter in the center of the figure, the letter Yud, which is often used as a metaphor for the human because the Yud is the most tiny character in the Hebrew alphabet. So the human as the Pentala Yud, the tiny character in the huge universe. And then in the middle of the Yud is the word is the letter Lamed, which is blood colored because Lamed is the first letter of the Hebrew word Lev or heart. Here's some other images of Adam. The image on the left is by the artist Mark Podwell. And in a way, this is, you could say that this is almost the most accurate picture. This is very inspired by the tradition of Kabbalah, by all the different spherod, all the different spheres of influence and, and, and attributes that are, attribute, that are often represented in the human body. This is um, Adam Kadmon, or the primeval Adam, or the Adam beyond this world. And then and then this on the right is the artwork by Grisha Bruskin, the spiral man, which I just couldn't resist putting in there. So it's, it's, it's confusing being a human and it's ambiguous being a human. And we're constantly trying to understand it. And I just couldn't resist putting this particular image in there. 
So, so there, the, we, we've covered some ideas about, the, about why the creation story of being created in the image of holiness and being created from earth teach us how they teach us some things about, about universalism and, and respect for universal respect for human life. The second thing I'd like to look at is God modeling a balance between judgment and mercy. And this is very, very much from the tradition of Midrash that we started talking about at the very beginning of the presentation. <clears throat> when the human is created, when God says, let us make man, the, the Adam, the earth creature, the human, in our image, after our likeness, the rabbis ask, did God consult anybody? And Rabbi Yehoshua, in the name of Rabbi Levi, said, God took counsel. God checked in with heaven and with the works of heaven and earth, like a king who checks with their advisors without whose knowledge they can do nothing. And Rabbi Simon said, when God began to create Adam, the angels formed themselves into parties. And some said, don't create humans because there's going to be problems. And others are saying, create humans because they have capability. They can, they can learn how to be good. They can learn how to, how to praise creation. And so there was a struggle between the negative interpretation of human potential and the positive interpretation of human potential. And, and God, in this story, gives mercy precedent and gives mercy the benefit of the doubt. And that's why it's written, faithfulness and truth meet justice and wisdom. Um, uh, that justice and shalom, justice and well-being, justice and mercy, kiss. So when the Holy One was about to create Adam, God was able to see both the righteous people and the wicked people who would come from Adam. And so what I was alluding to earlier is God said, if I create Adam, wicked people will be created. If I don't create Adam, how are righteous people to be born? And so Rabbi Berachia said, what did the Holy One do? God diverted the way of the wicked from before his sight. God put that knowledge off to the side and partnered with the quality of mercy. And the, and the, I, the quality of mercy of, of, of Rachamim and the quality of God came together to make the human. And so... The question is, the really fundamental question is, what can we learn from God, from, from the divine modeling, putting mercy, putting capa the, the capability to be just ahead of the mistakes we're going to make in the creation of humanity? What can we learn from that? And in the end, in Pirkei Avot, it said, on three things does the world stand, on justice, on truth, and on peace, because it's written with truth, justice, and peace shall you judge in your gates. And so we're being asked to judge in our gates and to seek out the truth, but also to do the challenging work of making peace, because we are partners with God, and we are emulating what God has modeled for us. So I've covered a lot very quickly. So I'm going to pause again and see if there's any questions about this, including about this, who these people are who are making this commentary, because this is exactly what I was talking about regarding Midrash being like, like time traveling Facebook over the centuries and filling in the gaps where there is not language written in the printed Bible. 
you know, I don't, I don't see any, any comments yet. Um, oh, wait, I, I do see Margie saying, um, and they are female. Uh, I think about the, um, uh, all the, 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 the African-American, the painting of African-Americans or black, the, the black creation story that you had earlier. Maybe that's, that was it, Margie. Um, but I, I, I've all, I, I noticed that this moment, um, um, that, you know, there, there's a lot of negative stuff happening in the world. And so the, 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 the debate about wicked people and good people and righteous <laughs> people, I mean, is, is a debate that we all have, right? And, and so this, this story from, from Genesis about, you know, Genesis Rabbi 8, 8, 4 is really, um, that's quite lovely. And, and if only we could give, I mean, what, it, what, it's, what it's encouraging me to do is to consider giving the benefit of the doubt to both myself and to other human beings. Yes, I think that those of us who are activists who have been involved in the struggle for justice that's going on now and in struggles for justice in the past, we need to constantly check in our, with ourselves. How merciful are we being to the people who we, we have to be in conflict with? Right. How do we how do we transform that into being partners with them? It's a it's a hard question, and and I I think it behooves all of us to really um, have that awareness that you just mentioned, Terry. And in terms of of the creation of humanity, the human being shown as a black woman, and all the heavenly beings, including the goddess being black woman. Um, it's interesting that caused an uproar on the internet because we have been, you know, people have been so assiduously acculturated to the idea that of course, Adam is a white man. Of course, God is a white bearded man with a much longer beard than mine. And, but really when we look at the complexity of of multiple traditions, that's not the case. That's only one small part of the story. So, and, so, Mar so Margie has a, a question. Um, she says that, you know, uh, Rabbi Ted Falcon, who, who we both know, um, often interprets the language about removing a rib is actually taking a whole side of the Adam. And she asks, uh, does, uh, does my comment about the rib being an entire side make sense to you? Yes, and we're going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> and I wonder if it's a Margie I know. I don't know. We're, we're, we're not going to out Margie. No, we won't. <laughs> okay. So the third, we talked about two of the four asp, uh, areas of focus I want, I want to touch on in terms of um, the theme of the week of of the fundamental humanity, of connecting the fundamental, the fundamental humanity of us all. So we're going to return our focus to the creation of the, hint of the human, and we're going to look at it from a perspective of gender and gender fluidity, and zero in on that idea of male and female God created them. And, and indeed, this gets complicated. So let's keep moving along. So here's the text. And you notice in even in the English translation that half the half this verse is in the singular, the masculine singular, and half and and second person, and half of this verse is in the third person plural. And gender diverse. And so I'm going to be sharing some commentary from, from, um, from a translation of the Torah of, of the five books of Moses from, from a feminist perspective. And this is one of the first uh, sections I am creating now that I'm sharing. And so they ask, is Adam a man, singly sexed? doubly sexed, doubly gendered, what kind of creature is the human? And it's, it, as I just mentioned, it's hard to know. Hebrew is a gendered language. Every verb, every noun has gender. 
but but this particular verse we were just talking about really really stretches these these grammatical limits to to an immense degree So um, definitely singular and plural are at work. And, and so the verse says, second person, I'm just saying it this way, go bear with me for a moment. Second person was created in the image of holiness. Male and female, third person were created. How would you draw a ginger chart for this human being, for this creature? And there are several different ways that when I was teaching this to a B'nai Mitzvah class, a Bar and Bat Mitzvah class, we did this. First of all, we looked at it as a spectrum, as a linear spectrum with female at one end and mas feminine at one end and masculine on the other end and all those shades in between. Because after all, is it a, is it a stringent meeting point between feminine and masculine or is or is there a spectrum of experience there's also of course the idea of overlapping gender there's gender as a wheel as a circle with multiple expressions of gender converging on that human center and then of course there's the idea well I'll, I'll say that you could see this as being like a circulatory system and a really immensely complicated system of, of circulation and of sharing. And I would put out that these are some of the ways that we can look at the cre at what at what and who Adam, what and who the human creature created from earth is, as someone who the text says was created male and female in the same body. And here's just a wonderful little expansion of that, 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 and I can't quite see my text because Terry and I and Sharon are in a little box covering some of it up, but you can see the complexity that the rabbis envisioned this, this creature and how they love to use their numbers. Okay, so what, what does other Jewish tradition teach about this? Well, I can tell you that there are six terms for gender diversity in classical Jewish texts. And here they are. The term Zahar, and this by classical Jewish texts, I mean primarily the Talmud, but also uh, Mishnah and Gemara, which are part of the whole Talmudic uh, library. Zahar means male. Nekeva means female. The rabbis also worked with the terms androgynos, who is a person who has both male and female gender characteristics. And you can see that this is referred to multiple, many, many times in Talmud, in classical Midrash, and in Jewish law codes. A tumtum is a person whose sexual characteristics are indeterminate or obscured. And, in, and again, huge numbers of references in the tradition. And, a, and, a, I, and a Adonit is a person who is identified as female at birth, but develops what we can say are, quote, male, unquote, characteristics. And again, multiple references in the tradition. And a Saris, who is a person who is identified at male as male at birth, but develops female characteristics. And, um, and a person can be naturally a saris, essentially biologically saris, or they can be a, become a saris through human intervention. And I don't think I need to say to anybody how modern this sounds. And the, this is from the tradition beginning a couple thousand years ago. Or, or even further, because really the rabbinic tradition, as we know it today, begins about 2,400 years ago. Hmm. 
So these are resonant with the terms that we're, we use in contemporary discourse. We're talking about people who are trans, people who are transsexual, people who are intersex, people who are gender non-conforming, people who are binary. So who would have thought that all of this would be contained in those several words, male and female, the human was created. Hmm. It's, so let's look at some artistic uh, responses to this idea. First of all, this isn't just from, from the Abrahamic traditions. This is from an ancient Greek amphora. And this references the story that among other sources is referenced by Plato, that, that humans were created originally with four arms, four legs, a head, two faces, etc., And that Zeus eventually split this human creature. Here is uh, something that I found. I don't know how it got into the into into information related to the conceptual artist uh, Marcel Duchamp, but he collected this image of of Ad Adam Kadmon, the primeval and otherworldly Adam, and it shows both a kabbalistic interpretation of the gender diversity of the human creature, and also a very literal interpretation. And this isn't, this is more diagrammatic than art from my perspective, but let's keep on moving along here. And then Chagall became, what did, during his, his early years as an artist, worked with this theme a lot. And I think it's pretty obvious what he's doing here. Um, showing, showing, a very basic um, um, gen uh, multi-gendered human being on the right, and then a reference to the Garden of Eden on the left. And I'm intrigued by the fact that the human has three apples in their hands. And then here is a quite famous painting that that Chagall did. And again, showing the passage of time and, and the fruit of knowledge, the fruit that gives human beings fair, uh, free will. And again, the androgynous gender diverse human being. So those were some examples of some limited examples of artistic responses. I don't want to overwhelm people. Let's take a pause and see if there's any more comments or questions. So one of the, um, sorry. So one of the, um, one of the uh, attendees here is saying it, it does, he says it does sound contemporary, but it's clearly old. Exactly. It's kind of, he says it's common knowledge in Jewish tradition and teaching, um, like when students are, so, so is it, or he said, yeah, he's asking, is it common knowledge in Jewish tradition and teaching, like when students are preparing for bad or bar mitzvahs? I think, <clears throat> as, as they said, this, this is, this is part of the Jewish tradition. It's been around for centuries. And, but I think that, um, I think it's been less a matter of common discussion, but now um, people are, are talking about this a lot, at least in the communities I'm part of. At least I would say definitely in, in the conservative, and in the, in the reconstructionist, renewal, conservative and reformed communities, absolutely, um, this is being taught. And as a matter of fact, the first time I saw this was on the website of American Jewish World Service, which ha actually has a, a, a niche where they have a lot of learning on a lot of different subjects, a lot of, a lot of lesson plans. And 
And I hadn't known about this. And it was very exciting to find out about this, about, about this very, very, very old material. And in the Orthodox community, I think that as, you know, there, there are, there is revolution going on in the Orthodox community in many ways. And I, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure that uh, people are working with these topics. Thank you. Okay, so our final category that we're going to be looking at is gender equality and partnership. And we're going, and that's where we're really going to look at what Marcia, what Marcy was talking about. The creation of Eve and and the idea that Adam should not be alone, that Adam deserves a partner. And, and as it says in the text that we're looking at, it's not good for, I will say, the human to be alone. The human needs a helper and a partner. And I'll say that, that there's, of course, a debate about what helper means. And that's literally what the Hebrew says, but there's all sorts of help that people can provide to one another. There is a servant who's a helper. There's also a comrade who is a helper. And, um, and then we go on to the human is giving names to all these other creatures, but there's no one to be a partner in, in such a significant piece of work. And there's no one to give a name to the human. And then, and then, so the so the text, our source text goes, moves along, and God puts a deep sleep upon the human. And while the human sleeps, God takes what I'm going to simply call part of the human's body, and right now, and closes up the flesh at that spot, and fashions that part into. Eve into Chava, into a woman, and brings her now to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she came from me and we're united. And of course, I'll acknowledge that there's a lot of different interpretations of this. So let's get into the translation debates about that body part I was being so ambiguous about. Because, because it, with, the, with the Hebrew Bible, with the Chumash, the five books of Moses, with the Torah, how you translate the Hebrew really, really makes a huge difference in many, many cases. So, so the text says that Eve is created from Adam's Selah. And that's usually translated as rib. However, That's a misconception. It's, it's perhaps the most common translation. But according to the opinion of, of Rashi, one of the great rabbinic uh, commentators and many other, other rabbis, woman was created from one side of Adam, not from his rib. Because... because of what Selah means in other parts of the Torah and in other scripture. So there's three basic interpretations and some of them are just weird and we'll see these in a second to understand which part of Adam was used to create Eve. Some commentators said that Eve was created from Adam's tail. I'll let you dwell on that for just a moment. Some commentators asserted, indeed, that Selah meant, means rib. But many commentators say that there's, that the word Selah means side based on the androgynous character of the human. And if we dig into this even deeper, if we go deeper into the weeds, 
the rabbis love even to talk about the letter forms when we're trying to figure out what language means. So this is the Hebrew word, the Hebrew letter Sadi. And Sadi is the first letter in the words, in the word Selah, which is the letter that we're trying, the word that we're trying to figure out right now. So the Zohar says that the top two Yuds, and I see, I made two Yuds there, that make up, that form the crown of the Hebrew letter Tzadi, represent a double-faced creature originally created by God. And they debated whether the two beings face the same direction or opposite direction. And so this led to an argument between rab the rabbis Yosef Karo and the Arizal on how to properly write this letter in the Torah. By the way, did you know that a double Yud is a common way to represent the name of God in Jewish prayers, in, in, in printed prayers. So, um, say the word Selah in many, many other parts of, of Hebrew scripture actually refers to any side, including the side of a building. And so, and so I would say that if you're going to look at this from a, from a humanistic so, uh, justice and gender equality perspective. Definitely the idea that the human being was essentially filleted to make the other human being and that they were, and that there was an equality of, of physical presence makes a lot of sense. So here we are looking again from the five books of Miriam, a woman's commentary on the Torah, where God is being, and they mentioned the idea that uh, that Eve is created by C-section rather than by bone graft. God serves as Adam's midwife, not a surgeon. Um, and and in chapter the two creation stories are not actually so different. In chapter one, Adam's presented as both male and female. In chapter two, woman emerges from the man's body and the man ultimately merges back with her. And that occurs just a little bit later in the scripture where it says a man leaves his, his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. In both cases, human wholeness depends on an other to complete the divine image. Now, if we circle back to the idea that, that so many of us are learning about and and many people are actually encountering within their own identities right now of what of what gender diversity means and about the spectrum of, of gender diversity the fact that we know people who are trans we know people who have all these different experiences i'm thinking of all the friends i have who who would say that they are non-binary um that Let's, let's embrace that complexity and weave it back into what these commentators are saying. Again, uh, I'm thinking about what I mentioned earlier about maybe it's not so much of a, of a linear spectrum, but it's actually more like a circle and the humans in the middle. And there's all these divergent influences working on us. And, and these divergent influences and the fact that they apply to all of us represent our universal connection. So that was a lot to deal with. Let's take another pause. Commentary? Questions? I think people are doing okay right now. Okay. <clears throat> and here is, a is another comment from the Five Books of Miriam, which is really a really useful book. I recommend it to everybody. So, um, so the Torah states that Eve's Hebrew name, Chava, comes from Chai, meaning life, because she's the mother of all, of all living beings. If Eve's the mother of all life, what does that make Adam? Is Adam the father of all living things? And, and, how does that circle back into the idea that Adam and Eve had birthed one another? 
from Adam's sweep emerges Eve, from Eve's awakening emerges Adam's future. And here are some images. Um, here we circle back to Michelangelo when we're looking at art. And I have to say that I'm, I have some criticism of this, some discomfort with this particular image. Because when we're looking at the body language of Eve and, and the body language of the anthropomorphic God, that raises a lot of questions for me. And it may for the others of you as well. As an artist, I think this is amazing work. In terms of the implications of it, I, I struggle with that. Here, I just couldn't, after that heavier reflection, I couldn't re resist putting a little bit of fun in here. Um, this is a miniature painting from Turkey, Islamic art from Turkey, showing Adam and Eve. Uh, the Islamic uh, tradition, the Islamic interpretation of whether to show the human image or not really varies at different times in history and in different places in the world, in different cultures. And so in both um, Turkey and in Persia, in modern day Iran, at certain times, the human figure actually was painted quite a bit. But I just love the these two particular images of Adam and Eve with the halos of flame and with that angel and the angel lurking in the background. And don't forget the idea of angels being like messengers and angels being the real, the real servants, the real helpers who help create the human being and who, and who speak up to God and of course, wrestle with humans. And this is uh, on the right, you see the, uh, uh, artwork by Paul Clay, Adam and Little Eve. So Eve is literally being birthed from Adam. She's emerging from Adam. And I just I, I, I didn't know about this particular piece until this week. And I, I think it's a really interesting little piece. And, and being in Paul Clay, it's probably several inches tall. This is, I don't know who did this, but this is an interesting Russian Orthodox icon. Again, a very anthropomorphic creative figure. And I find it interesting how um, the figure of Adam and the figure of Eve are almost like um, two books or two leaves of paper being separated that uh, rotated in a sense. You can't, I, I'm making a gesture like this with my hands. Here is a very strange, on the left, medieval um, illumination of the creation of Eve, which really doesn't fit into the stereotypical image of Eve being created from the rib of Adam. But here, it really is like a C-section where, where Eve is emerging from from the opening of Adam's side. And uh, the and she almost looks like, and it's rather curious, the gesture that the anthropomorphic divine figure is making, holding onto her wrist and, and that particular um, gesture that's being made. So, so Reiner, uh, Margie just, just uh, suggested that, um, that for her, um, uh, I think it helps to emphasize the Ha Adam in Hebrew, with the translation being the the original Earthling. Yes. So it's not like that Adam dot Adam dude down the street, right? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I keep saying the Adam, um, the Earth creature, the human, because and in in, in, in these creation stories. It takes a bit before Adam has a name, Adam. Before that, Adam is the human, really. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I found, you know, um, I, I keep circling back to Chagall. This is opinion on the right is opinion by Chagall. And here is this imagining of the dreamland, the dreamscape of humanity becoming diverse. And, and it's very sweet that Adam is imagining what another human could be like and what it would be like to have a comrade, a partner. And that in a sense, Adam is creating, is dreaming into existence, Adam's own partner. And uh, here is, here's another interesting painting by the English artist, Henry Inlander, who uh, work, lived in the, in, who I think passed away in, in the 70s. And I found this intriguing because A, it looks like it's happening out in the English countryside with houses out there in the distance, with huts in the distance, and B, the way the, the way natural forms are really woven into the human experience. And also um, the way the ambiguity of the divine force, almost like a tornado bringing or a form bringing Eve down into down to meet with a human. Is it bringing the second human form into the sleeping human? Or is it pulling it out of the sleeping human? It's ambiguous, and I, I think that's very interesting. And it looks like it would be a very cool painting to look up, to view up close because it's so textured. And here is another uh, English artist from the first half of the 20th century, um, Leon Underwood. And uh, I, I think this is almost rather funny, almost rather comical. What in the world is going on with that split of the two humans, the, 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 the you know, two humans being created? Are they astonished by one another? Are they frightened by one another? Why is there, why is there lightning in, in, the, in the divine hand? Um, I think there's all sorts of different ways you could look at this painting. Yeah, kind of a shocked to be joined at the hip. Yes. Yes. And surprised and yeah. <clears throat> and then I circle back to Chagall. Um, Chagall had a cubist phase um, from about 1911 to about 1915. And, and this is this the type this is titled Adam and Eve and it <clears throat> and I think it's very interesting how the figures are broken up and, com and complex and 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 how it's hard to see hard to tell where one figure ends and another figure begins the entire picture plane is is fractured to a certain degree where where it meets the human forms. And, of course, there's also the implication of the serpent, which is also fragmented. Uh, one thing I will comment about is that in the Jewish tradition, and I understand the Muslim tradition, there is no doctrine of original sin. That as, as, as the humans are created, they are partners with one another, but it's but certainly in the Jewish tradition, it's also, also essential for the humans to be partners with the divine. That we are in a state of perpetual dialogue with with the holy. And and so that that as we move towards the eating of the fruit of knowledge, that was essential for humans to be if they're going to be partners with, with the divine, to have free will and to have the knowledge of good of right and of wrong, of good and of evil. But that's getting ahead of us. 
I just want to acknowledge that because we do have Chagall's uh, implication of the servant in this particular painting. Yeah, and I, I just want to make sure that that we all recognize that that Christian notions of original sin vary widely. Yes, and that the street version of that is that human beings are somehow bad or evil or wrong is really a, a one 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 part of that, very damaging, but <clears throat> not necessarily normative. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. That, that's very true, and I know, I know that there's a lot of diversity in the Christian tradition about that idea. You and I were talking early, chatting be, earlier before we began the Zoom webinar about, and you mentioned Teshuvah, and, um, and I just had a great thought about it, about that, in the sense that, in the sense that, uh oh, uh oh, I just, okay. When we're talking, when we're talking about 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 the capacity to make errors. Okay, I just lost it. Hopefully, I'll think about it. But what I want to say is that is that okay? I almost have it. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> if I were in a room with you, I would probably be doing better. <laughs> um, Tishuva literally means it's often translated as repentance, mm -hmm. but it comes from the Hebrew word to return. It mm -hmm. literally means to turn around. And, and in the Jewish tradition, the idea about repentance, about acknowledging our sins, is that is based on the on the idea that the Hebrew word for sin, chet, actually is related to the to ideas of archery, that we're shooting an arrow at a target and we're missing the target. Our behavior is missing the mark. Yeah. And what we need to do is turn around and get back on a decent path. And when we think about, about these creation stories, when we think about the idea that God had to do teshuva and turn towards the quality of mercy as having priority over strict judgment, that God needed to give humanity the benefit of the doubt, when we talk about the idea of of Eve, because she was created from the side, the half of Adam, mm -hmm. being totally a partner and a comrade with Adam, when we talk about, about how within each of us, each of us individual humans, that we have this incredible diversity, both in terms of the, of, of the wisdom tradition, how we were created according to scripture, but also the reality of our of how of all the potential that this teaching about gender brings up that 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 to make to shiva to take accountability also means to look at this to turn towards this complexity that that not only modern politics and science and social theory offer but also the wisdom tradition the ancient traditions so i think that's where i was heading with that with what you were saying about original sin and the fact that you and I had the conversation about Tushuva, about repentance, because repentance really means to circle back again. Yeah, and, I, and we don't need to move on to it too much. I just think um, the, 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 the notion of original sin, in, in my view, and this is just me, uh, is, is, that, is, is just simply a, a vulnerability that humans have and that we all share to reject life as it's been given to us <clears throat> in, in an entropic universe with mortality and, and beauty yes. mixed together. And, and that that gets worked out in us in lots of different ways. But uh, even, even um, you know, those ancient uh, writers that talked about original sin really were focused a lot in their writings on mortality and kind of the rejection of it. And so, and so it isn't, it isn't that human beings are bad. In fact, the, the notion of it is that we reject the goodness of human life. <laughs> That's actually more the, more of the point. And so some definitions of original sin, in my view, actually, <coughs> actually are expressions of original sin because they make us reject human life as good and beautiful and complex and challenging and, and all of that. Thank you, Terry. And in relationship to how you 
you know, rejecting the good, that brings up the, the idea that gets referred to in a lot of these stories about, about the separation of one part of humanity from another part of humanity, that mm -hmm. the primordial human creature, the atom, is cleaved in half and that and that that and then there we have this constant urge to reconnect and certainly in that in that greek reference the ancient greek reference that we looked at the idea that a, a human creature was created with multiple limbs and zeus had to uh uh cleave that 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 human creature in half and they're always wandering the world now looking for their other half um, a lot of the time that gets presented as something very, very negative as compared to being something that's very hopeful. The idea that, of course, we're looking for other humans so we can reconnect with other humans. And isn't it? And, and if we, if none of this cleaving had occurred, whether, whether through the fruit of knowledge or whether through these creation stories about the divine cleaving us, what kind of humans would we be? And you know, we we are here to work with what we what we create and what we've been given, and to make beauty from that. Mm -hmm. And if everything were just bland and undifferentiated, how could we possibly do that? Yeah. So, which is which is part of what makes Zoom teaching art on Zoom very difficult. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm about to move into that. And I really, really wish that I didn't have to do things this way. And it may be that this is a time when you might want to take some notes, but you don't have to because the way I'm saying to do things, you do not have to do. But let's go ahead. Okay, so we've looked at these themes as expressed in various responses, responses both textural and artistic. We've talked about, we've talked about universal humanity We've talked about that balance between judgment and mercy. We've talked about gender fluidity, and we talked about gender equality and partnership. So now it's time for you to hopefully go off and make your own artwork if you're so inspired. And so I'll give you some suggestions about how to do this, but you can totally do your own thing. And Holden Village and Paddle Understanding can give you direction on the if you need it about how to share your art on Instagram and other platforms. Terry, do you want to say anything about that right now? Yeah, so if you if you are an Instagram person, you can go to Holden Interfaith. That's it. Holden Interfaith and what you're going to see there it, so it's just it's not a mistake is the beginning of my 4th grade automobile that I used to draw when I was in 4th grade all the time. It's not the full thing. That's just the beginning. Uh, but uh, but so you can share it there. So the hashtags is just attached to your photo. The hashtag Holden Interfaith. If you uh, would like to share it with via email, you can send it to Ian E A N at paths to understanding dot org. And then what, what I think we're going to do in a week or two is we'll put together some of the artwork into a little video and we'll share that on Facebook. And, uh, and you can kind of let us know if you want yourself named as an artist or not. But it would be just kind of fun to be able to see what each other are working on because that's part of the fun of art. And so it's Holden, it's hashtag Holden Interfaith and it's Ian at pathstounderstanding.org. Now there's something I want to emphasize to all of you. You don't have to be an artist to make art. You don't have to have training. You don't have to have some kind of magical facility. Um, I have never seen someone who I couldn't teach how to draw. Everybody comes from some basic uh, creative visual thinking place. Uh, people say, I can't draw a straight line. And I say, that's what straight edges are for. So please, don't be don't be shy. Um, I think I've only shared my own take on this particular on these particular topics. I'm sure that in the spirit of diversity, the multiplicity of human perspectives, you have a lot you can share too. And with that, you don't also have to you don't have to
to, you can be very, very simple in what you do. So if we were in the same room together, I would be going in the direction of having really simple materials because we wouldn't have much time to do artwork. You have a lot of time to do artwork now. I just can't see what you're doing. You can't see what I'm doing. But in an usual situation, I'd have drawing paper for you and I have diverse colored papers. I'd have some scissors and glue and simple drawing materials. But if you want to get more sophisticated, if you, if you are a person who does watercolor, if you love to simply draw or paint or sculpt, more power to you. When you work with your materials, be aware of how techniques and feelings intersect, how your technique influences your, your um, statement. If you rip paper, that's a much different kind of statement than if you cut paper. If you draw a flowing line versus a jagged line, that's a different kind of language. If you work with smooth marks or a smooth collage versus a rough or textured use of materials or marks, that will express something different. And if you utilize contrast of value, which is art talk for darkness and light, darkness or lightness, or hue, art talk for color, that can also make a difference in how expressive you are, how exactly how you're conveying something. You can work with representational forms or you can work totally abstractly. I thought maybe I would share with you some examples of what other people have done, but I actually decided no, that would, pre that would prejudice you too much. And I apologize for that if, that, if that's frustrating. But I really have great confidence in your, in your collective abilities to do artwork. Symbolism and content, elements and actors. If you're like me, as I did with this webinar, you may have the impulse to throw the kitchen sink at a project. Try not to. So, I'm going to list several optional, what I would call visual actors for each theme and text, and less can be more. So what I'm hoping you'll do is that you'll you choose one of the themes and or texts that we worked with for your artwork. Terry, um, is there a way that the next several slides I'm going to show can be shared with people? if they want to refer back to them? Well, you know, and if everybody's gonna be able to, to watch these on um, on uh, on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, but what I'll do is I will I will screen capture them and I'll post them uh, in, 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 a, in on Facebook, on Pass to Understanding's uh, Facebook page. Okay, you don't need to screen, you don't need to screen capture them because I've got the images. Okay. I'll do that and send it to you. Okay. Okay. Okay, when we look at the theme of universal humanity, our source is the creation of Adam, the Adam, the earth creature, the human creature, but Selimel him in the image of holiness from earth materials. And if you were going to have different components, I could see a representation of divinity, holiness, God, creative force, however you want to show that. Would it be anthropomorphic? Would it be totally abstract? That's up to you. Material, what do I mean by material? Essentially, you know, the material that is being used to create the human creature. The human creature itself, perhaps. And then there's a very um, interesting thing that gets mentioned, which is breathing breath or spirit into the human creature. And when you look at when you look at it from a Jewish perspective, the Hebrew language works with air. So, so neshama is soul, and it's also the word for breath. And ruach is spirit, but it's also the word for wind. So, how would you show spirit? How would you show breath, spirit, breath, wind? Be, be as an enlivening force. I also will mention that you could put other actors in it because 
Midrash tells us that there were these angels moving at high speeds around the, the, the universe that was coming into being, collecting earth and bringing it back to be used in creation. So how would, how would you represent that if you chose to? So those are some <coughs> possible elements that you could utilize in creating artwork on this particular theme of the universalism of humanity. Here's a challenge. How would you show divinity modeling the balance of judgment and mercy? That God makes a conscious decision to pursue mercy, to partner with mercy and create humans despite the risk that the angels were warning God about. How, why, how, you know, God creating, going ahead and creating the human knowing that, sure, humans would do, do things that were wrong, but they would also do things that were, that were righteous. So possible elements again would be divinity or holiness in whatever form you want to show that. Could you, <coughs> excuse me, could you show advocating or arguing angels? Could you show heaven and earth arguing and debating? How would you show the human creature <coughs> and how would you represent the qualities of mercy and judgment? I'm going really fast here, I know. And I apologize for that. Do people need me to slow down to go back at I all? I think you're okay because what's gonna happen is, is I think in this section, mm -hmm. I would encourage people to, to listen to Reiner here and then come back as you're starting to think about your artwork and come back to this part of the, uh, of the Facebook live stream and you'll be able to kind of listen to these mm -hmm. instructions again. So that, I think it's gonna be okay, Reiner. Okay. So we're getting more abstract and more concrete at the same time, the spectrum of gender fluidity. And our source for that is that Ha'adam, the Adam, the human was created male and female. Again, how do you show holiness? How do you show the human? How do you show gender complexity? And how do you show all of that being woven into one, one circumstance? one being, one unity. And then with gender equality and partnership, our source is that Eve is created from the side or the half of Adam. We're arguing that Eve was not created from a rib. And, and I apologize to all the people, all the commentators, all the sages from the past, who insist that she was created from a rib. In any case, um, I would say in all of these, I'm describing holiness as being an actor. But now we show the division and the birth of new humans, Adam and Eve, as co-creators, co-infants, co-partners. And so how would you show that? And I emphasize that with any of these things, plenty of these ideas are not ideas that you need that are easy to show through representational art. So feel free to be totally abstract if you make art on, on any of these themes. So we are just almost at time this would be an excellent time for any questions have been or observations that have been really bugging you. So I'm just checking the comment sections here, uh, Reiner. I don't see any any comments yet. It's going to be really interesting to try to. It's going to be really fun to try to to try to represent this. Um, I think for myself, I'm going to go pretty pretty non um, non anthropomorphic. I think uh, 
except for the the human form i think one thing that people can experiment with is they can <clears throat> experiment with cut and torn paper they can experiment with the mean with the meaningfulness of color they and 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 all those other things i mentioned that you can do technically to convey feeling and interpretation. If we were meeting in person, we would be making art right now and we come back together and people would be sharing that art. And it would be what in art school we call a critique, where in, which is a very positive thing where we would put all the art up and people would talk about their art and they'd answer questions and hear responses. So I wish I could do that with all of you. I have no idea of how many of, how many of you there really are, but I appreciate your being here. Well, we've had an average of about 26 uh, to 28 people um, all the time. And uh, so that's, that's, that's really great. And I just want to say that on Thursday night, there's going to be an opportunity to come and kind of meet with Reiner and Amina from Sunday evening and kind of, you know, share any challenges that you're having about um, some of the art that you're working on and they can kind of do some coaching with you. So Thursday night at six, and then remember um, as well that tomorrow night we're going to be having a conversation at, from six to seven thirty uh, with some, myself and some some other interfaith leaders um, working on uh, on the issue of of uh, the centrality of love of neighbor uh, within the Abrahamic traditions. And so we're gonna we'll have a fun time tomorrow night. Then Thursday night is the is the time for kind of conversation with Reiner and Amina, and then. Um, and then uh, on Friday night, we've got another interfaith conversation on human beings as part of the ecosystem. And so that's going to be on Friday at 6 p.m. So we have several people saying thank you uh, for, for doing this, Reiner. And then um, someone said uh, that it would be lovely if Reiner and others would give critique when things are posted on Instagram um, as though we're together. Um, mm -hmm. This was inspiring, uh, he said. So I think it's a he. I'm not sure if it's a he. So anyway. Well, um, I'm, I'm I, glad I, I, to do that. And so it's really, really uh, great that all of you could, could join us tonight. We're so thankful uh, to have you all here. Rita says, wonderful, and thank you. And I just really appreciated, Reiner, I had never heard in all my years of, of being a pastor uh, about the, the Jewish teaching around, around um, the spectrum of, of gender and gender identities. And I, I just that just is really awesome. So I'm going to have to go back and watch again and be able to, to teach a little bit of that myself. So thank you for that. Okay, one comment I'd make is that all the material I shared and much, much more is available. Also, I, I, can, I can share it with you if anybody makes a request. Also, um, Terry, you have that, those texts that I, sent, that I gave you to send yeah. out to anybody who you were able to send them out to, which includes a lot of references here. If you get though if you have those texts from terry that were sent out previously i really urge you just for the fun of really understanding rabbinic process to read the whole discussion the whole piece about about whether eve was created from a rib or a side it's so really a rather remarkable summation of all the different arguments it's it's quite classic I don't yeah. use Instagram. I know I should. Well, I know that it's it's a platform that as a visual person would be useful for me to use. So um, I'll figure a thing, I, I'll figure it out how I can have dialogue like Terry was mentioning. Maybe I just need to dive in and go on Instagram in the next couple of days. Well, and then, and then just one other piece, if, if you want that, uh, that document that Reiner's talking about, go to pathstounderstanding.org you look at Holden Interfaith Week, and then and then once you pop that up, you'll see in the, in the one of the main sections down there a link to a little blog about about tonight's uh, tonight's class, and in and in that you'll you'll be able to click on a little link that will get you that document downloaded to your computer or iPad or phone or whatever. So uh, we're we're grateful to Reiner for for all your work tonight. Reiner, you did great, uh, even though it's hard to not come together. It, it, hard to come together through Zoom like like we did it, and I can't wait to dig in and try to try to make some art about the uh, the themes that you suggested to us. Okay, so Terry, 
Mic yeah. check. Mic check. I want you to repeat after me to all the people who were on the call. You're going. You're going to abyss, abyssal Yiddish. I'm going to abyssal Yiddish. Zeit. Zeit. Gesund. Gesund. Gleek. Gleek. Und stark. Und stark. Zeit. Gesund. Gleek. Und stark. To your health, luck, and strength. Go for it, people. Peace, everyone. Have fun making some art. Don't watch the news. Just go make some art for a little while. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Terry, for being a comrade. Thank you. Thank you, Reiner. You did great.